conversation. Uh, today's session is really uh, stimulated from uh, some accidents, uh, di some discussions on the other text uh, discussion forum, CyberCon. Uh, and uh, also there's somebody who wants to come to Global Remy to speak and uh, several of us had some uh, conversation with this person. And, uh, and that comes with uh, uh, Bernard's quotation of uh, some people terminate their conversation. Uh, I mean, conversation that terminate the conversation is something we need to pay attention to. Uh, so, so the topic I put it here is academic original things and our possible footprints. And so to be uh, a little contribution. And the, this diagram is uh, my previous uh, taxonomy of a system of thinking, uh, which I classified as a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight levels. So the highest level of a system thinking is named the reflective system or learning processes. So that's the attention we uh, we are trying to do today. So, so I'm simply just trying to walk my talk. Uh, and uh, so my key question is, if cybernetics were our Jesus Christ, okay, were, I mean, then what would be the antichrist that we should be alert to? Uh, I, I had a little list here. The first one is of course, anti-feedback. Uh, it is all occupied by the linear, single, one-way causality, uh, causality only, not seeing feedback loops, blind to the loops. The second one would be anti-self-organization that is authoritarian, totalitarian, uh, socialism, communism, that a small group of allies trying to determine the life for everybody else in the whole society. Uh, third one would be the anti-cognitive eigenstate. Well, I, I just uh, temporarily invented <laughs> this term. It, in, in other words, it's anti-constructivism. So, so it's a stubborn realism and materialism. It's a strong truth reality doctrine that exclu excludes other possibilities of our creativity. Uh, Anti-reflection is the dogmatism, uh, anti-critical thinking, and blind belief in rationality, thinking that rationality would resolve everything. Uh, uh, but uh, the one I want to highlight is, is this concept I inherited from uh, Hayek. Well, he created the term fatal concept. Uh, originally, he, he mean the utopian idea of socialism. This, the subtitle of, the, of his book is The Errors of Socialism. But I would like to push the envelope a little bit more. I would like to push it uh, to extend it to mean all frequently observable blind belief in rationality. So not, not just suspend questioning all our beliefs, but uh, particularly the belief in rationality. Uh, this is why the, the topic of designing government is very sensitive that I think we needed to deal with it very carefully. It's because there is a big trap there that uh, that's, they can, we can easily make mistake to create a utopian and a disaster for others. So, uh, and uh, there, um, uh, there is another um, way to seeing this blind belief in uh, rationality. You could call it, you could call it a degree of uh, our smartness, our intelligence, our cognitive capacity, capability higher than others, so that uh, we definitely. Uh, 
Check. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, she muted. Uh, anyway, so, so to continue this, I want to push it into this uh, single, uh, synchronous. Uh, you can pronounce it ya uh, yo. Uh, it's very useful because it means I am right, you are wrong. It, this is something to against uh, Jonathan's elephant metaphor, because if, if every one of those blind person uh, believe that uh, he or she is the only correct person, and there will be no, there will be no possibility left for other blind persons. And, and uh, cognitively, we are all blind uh, somewhere. Uh, so uh, this one is, I know more than you do. So uh, both of them uh, describe an attitude that I think is is the worst of our original sin that we need to try our best to avoid. Uh, so, um, and this phenomenon we can observe not only on the individual person, uh, sometimes you can, uh, or maybe most of the times you can, you can observe at the in institutional level. Uh, so, so that relates to this famous Downing Kruger effect. Uh, do you all know that? What is that? Uh, if not, uh, well, it it is a, a study that won the Ig Nobel Prize, not uh, not the serious Nobel Prize, but the Ig Nobel Prize. Uh, and uh, the the last one I want to put on this list would be. Another synchronous point, hidden assumption, which is not true. And we all, we frequently being uh, um, trapped by this kind of a hidden assumption because we're not aware of it, or if we, if we are not paying attention to the uh, unintended consequences that this kind of a, assumption brings us. So that's the list of uh, bad guys that we need to be alert of. Uh, Donning Krug effect simply says that uh, when you are in the um, stage of knowing, know nothing, your confidence level is kind of high, very high. And uh, it, it as high as it is forming a peak that uh, is called the peak of month stupid. So, so the, the theory goes that uh, when you are ex in the stage of ignorance, you usually have a lot of more confidence. And this is, a, in, they develop this theory by a real case that somebody uh, trying to rob a bank by putting some lemonade, uh, uh, lemon juice on his face because he, uh, that guy believed that uh, the lemon juice can be used uh, as an invisible ink. <laughs> Therefore, if he put uh, lemon juice on his face, people won't see him so he can rob the bank uh, effectively. He, so confidently he did that. So, so they did a study and they found this cut. And then as your, as your wisdom grows towards this direction, and you suddenly jump into a valley of disappear. You start awareing that actually you don't know a lot as you uh, assume. And then gradually you, you, you grow more and more wisdom and that's the slope of enlightenment and goes up to the plateau of sustainability. You're pretty satisfied and you're already getting old and retired. Uh, become an old guy with a lot of wisdom. So, so, so that my 
opinion is this curve is actually not one shot in one life. It actually repeating itself many, many times. So we are actually in a situation like we passed one uh, period of understanding and enter into a, a different a different context, different environment, different field, a different topic. So, so this process go always repeating itself on and on uh, until the time comes that we stop thinking and uh, learning. So, so given that situation, uh, I sort of summarized this original scene that we need to all be alert of and their possible remedies. So academic original scene on the left, possible remedies on the right. So I am right, you are wrong, can be offset by that we assume everybody else intent, intention was noble or other, they are just a different perspective. And we try to ask ourselves to respect the perception of others. And for the hidden assumption, which is not true, uh, we have to save ourselves using the power of questions. Not only question the other, but also question ourselves. So, so hopefully that we can dig out those untrue assumptions and get rid of them. And the third one is the addiction to monologue and, and uh, enjoying the solo presentation instead of engaging in conversation and questions uh, and, uh, and thinking about other people's questions and really respond it. So really listen might be uh, the remedy. Design and confident to know everything uh, that uh, I think can be cured by stay focused at your current top priority. Uh, ignoring questions from peers, uh, Bernardo mentioned this before, and uh, I think the only, uh, there's a limitation there because uh, it will be too, it will be too difficult to require we, address all the questions we see. But uh, if we could uh, build up with each other uh, thinking, and uh, we will be in a, a more constructive phase, in a more constructive mode, instead of uh, echo computation, solo presentation, and the debate. Uh, number six is, uh, uh, I have so much wisdom that I cannot finish in one minute or <laughs> one page. That is what we frequently observe that we can really practice to keep our responses short. That is the secret of why we require each of us bring only seven slides to, to our talk because that creates a space to let other people to put in, to, to input their um, different perspectives. Uh, so, uh, so uh, draw others into conversation and the things I speak, you don't need to speak. Uh, these are all bad habits. My usual email is 10 pages long with 100 URS to my other papers. Uh, so, to avoid that situation to happen, uh, uh, we can fix on. Uh, we can we can s uh, stay with this uh, uh, remedy. Statements can only be made in response of questions. So don't don't make unnecessary statements. So so that's my. Uh, well, this is my last slide possible academic footprints. So after everything, what can be done? What we can eventually accomplish before we die or, or by we die, by our death. Uh, the unfortunate group would be that 
Uh, I'm writing my book. I'm writing a big book in addition to the existing 800 miles of books in Library of the Congress that nobody is reading. So I don't think that is a very good um, finish line. Uh, I'm reading, a, I'm leading a school of thoughts. The members of it are producing a room full of books that are actually heading towards paper recycling. So, so unfortunate path is that uh, your intellectual power had actually been wasted. That, that's very miserable. So, so what we are looking, uh, what we are trying to achieve is that we go to this path. If we can repent all our original sins, that we probably will produce something that such as my equation became a needed part in future students' textbooks, such as my story became part of a history being read by future youngsters. And at the age of 84, Hans von Forrest summarized only 30 aphorisms. So, so you don't have to read the whole big tombs, uh, uh, so many difficult papers of Hans. You can only, or the future youngsters can only pay attention to his uh, condensed 30 aphorisms as what I call cultural genes to be passed to the other generation. I added the last one because we only, we can only do uh, seven minus plus two, right? So, so uh, using Jamie's concept of a container, uh, all of our human intelligent labor uh, can be put in these three columns and you can find out where you are. Uh, the first one is to know and you focused on why's you become a scientist and or you you are doing natural philosophy right here you're just doing thinking part and you extend it to system thinking uh, i'm still in the opinion that uh, system thinking includes cybernetics and not vice versa uh, uh, and uh, and you focus your your job is on the cognition side. And the second column is to do, you, you focus on how you become an engineer and you create artifacts and you do system analysis at a system thinking level, you do system analysis of real cases. Uh, and uh, your process, your, you focus on action in systematic sense. And last one is to communicate. Is you or you know something, uh, you are not able to completely do it. So you're trying to invite other people uh, to do. So you communicate. And here you need to address not only what but also why and how. And you become an entrepreneur. You create an organization. And you you, you are doing system synthesis here on real organizations. And eventually you build up a community and that is Club of Remy is doing uh, what we are doing here. We're building a community is part of a civilization. So, so that's my last slide. Mm, I used the 20 minutes, good. We still cannot hear you class. <laughs> Okay, new computer needed the next week. Uh, mm. Questions? Am I stopped the conversation? Yes, Jamie, please. <laughs> well, I think there were no questions because we were blown away by the kernel of truth in your presentation. <laughs> The 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 uh, uh, yeah the kernel of truth. Now I, I let someone else maybe put in words. I think what the what that kernel was. But I got 
um, that the focus needs to be on a small message and not on, on this whole uh, systems explanation, but at the same time, it needs to be cybernetic in that the message is within a system and it needs to be understood how that message is going to flow through the system. And so I was thinking specifically about the sociology of knowledge. And I don't know how much you have studied that, but, but you were basically using it as your practical guide from what I was hearing. Like look for a really nice clean message, study how it fits in the system and then keep on working on it one day at a time. Oh, uh, Mark. And uh, Jason, uh, I, I enjoyed all these talks. Could you just show your last slide again for just a second? <clears throat> I okay. use a very similar, I use a very similar framework, and I just want to ask you whether or not you think it makes sense to add another column, uh, which I think is generally left out. Um, a lot of people use a framework like you did, and, and who's in and who's out? Who are you going to talk to? So after why, I always add you know, <clears throat> who, the stakeholders, and then <clears throat> what are, you know, how out there for your, um, for your comment. I, I, I agree with that, Jamie, yep, that's. Yep. Um, so the question for the group then is, um, uh, can you change the world with a statement or with one comment? And I, I think if you look at the history of cybernetics, if you look back to the Macy conference, it's what you have to ask yourself is why were they so effective? And they were so effective because they brought together a large number of disciplines and the greatest minds in those disciplines came in with this uh, idea that they had that there was a science of sciences that, that, that you could, if you looked at systems, you could encompass all the other scientists, science. Um, uh, you've all got a better understanding of the history because you were there, um, I wasn't, but I think what happened after that was a lot of these sciences didn't give in easily. They absorbed those ideas into their own um, into their own systems and carried on their merry way. And um, cybernetics never and systems thinking never came out on top. Um, so the question you then got to ask yourself of, as Group Remy, if you want to make significant changes, is do you have to enact with all these other sciences? Have you got to find some magic button which brings them back into the realm of cybernetics? Uh, could I interject here something? Because I think uh, Jason is, is making progress in this direction. And I think the issue at the time of the uh, Macy conferences, uh, the sciences were uh, very uh, separated. Uh, yet they were able to bring together these, this group of highly educated and informed people uh, in such a way that they could communicate about uh, all of the sciences in a common language. And I, I think this is very much what uh, Lowell keeps talking about. The situation today, however, is uh, now 70 years later. And during these 70 years later, the various sciences have uh, established a huge collection of silos where communication between the silos is very, very difficult. And so from, from my perspective, the issue becomes uh, the symbol systems that are used in these different silos. These symbol systems are so radically different from each other that communication among the silos is not possible. And therefore, I have turned to mathematics and logic to try and communicate what I feel is my uh, goals and ambitions within the system that I uh, live within and within my value system. George. Yeah, the, um, in the IS, we're taking a somewhat different tack on this problem, noting that there are a number of what I call modern or updated sciences, which are uh, inherently integrative. Uh, planetary science, exobiology, um, there, there are a number of them that are actually discovering 
that they need systems thinking in order to work. They're transdisciplinary. And so what I've been doing is I've been inviting uh, some of these people from outside the IFSS to give presentations to our group. Uh, we have uh, Saturday morning, same time as this, this group, but on Saturday morning. And then uh, again, um, on, uh, well, it'd be Monday night for me, but I'm sorry, Sunday night for me, but in any case, uh, for the Eastern, the Eastern Bloc, um, Australia and, and uh, so forth. And uh, they are some of the most, some of the best systems thinkers that uh, I've run across because the, the nature of the science that they're doing is already integrated across uh, several disciplines. So they're, they're not siloed. Um, at least they're, they're, if they are, it's very limited. So I suggest that there is um, a way around this problem by not focusing on the traditional sciences, but rather by looking at four people who are already doing this. And there are a number of examples. I've even got a, um, a history professor from Stanford who's, who's been applying quantitative methods to try to find what he calls the shape of history. And uh, in order to do that, he has, has to employ quite a few systems principles. So I'm suggesting that, there, that this need not be the case, that we don't have to bring traditional um, disciplinarians into a common conversation because there are some people out there who are already discovering them. Oh, one other thing, Jason, I have to ask you about the, um, in your graph, um, the um, vertical axis was competence? Competence, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, sales uh, competence. Sales, sales competence. competence. Um, so the, from my reading of the literature and wisdom, uh, one becomes not so much confident in their own capability and their own wisdom as they gain that wisdom, but rather they're more comfortable with, um, with, with what they, their beliefs they think are um, uh, worth sharing with others. So it's not so much a matter of confidence as, as just a, a comfort level. They can, they can more easily deal with ambiguity and uncertainty and things of that nature. Peter, you have a lot of good comments in chat box. Could you recap those? Hello, Peter. He's not there. I am here. Are yes, you? I am here. Oh, okay, go um, ahead. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't have anything. I've said what I've said in the chat box. Um, I know, could I, just Respond I just don't then. think the metaphor of original sin and repentance is a good metaphor in this context. I'll just say that. Um, I, yeah. You know, I think I think it's bound up with guilt guilt mongering. Basically, the doctrine of original sin allows people to say that you're a sinner and therefore you need to be repented, and we're going to give you the means of repenting. So it's very it's very psychologically manipulative and. I mean, we see a lot of this sort of guilt mongering uh, stuff going on on the left and the right, uh, and I think it's awful. Uh, so I, I just think the, the language of sin is not the right. Not okay, the right. Now, what, <laughs> what will be the replacement? I mean, uh, my purpose is only to want to draw people's attention to those uh, natural tendencies that we will we will well, make you do those, get people's uh, attention if you start talking about sin. That's certainly true. Um, but, <laughs> you know, instead of sin, we can look to a better way of doing things, better ways of doing things, what we want to see, what our visions are of a better world and a better future, rather than, uh, you know, your ancestors committed this sin and therefore you're guilty of it. No, 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 not ancestor. I, I, I have no uh, biological in, in implication here. I mean, 
I mean, we as academics, we read more books than the average Joe and Jim. So after we read, we think we, that we learned a lot. So we start thinking that maybe our opinions is better than others. That is something I would like to, uh, would like us to pay attention to. Laura, you just raised your hand. Yeah, uh, I actually like the language of sin because cybernetics created the eighth deadly sin. The seven what deadly, is that? The seven deadly sins are, as Peter was saying, are means of control. Yes. Oh, yeah. They, they, yeah they you are, cannot deny that. <laughs> uh, okay. Now, the eighth deadly sin uh, came up uh, starting in uh, 1622 with Nova Morgum and the scientific method. And I'll get to the Quakers because the Quakers created a Quaker scientific method for social systems in parallel starting in the mid 1600s. But that's a separate. The eighth deadly sin that the Quakers and what cybernetics hold in common is the sin of organization. Whether it be the Catholic Church, whether it be the king, you know, wh whether it be the belief system that confines and constrains you. And, you know, the opposite of that is saying freedom. There's no such thing as freedom. It's the cybernetic insight of we're all contained within sort of structures. The question is, what's the best structuring of our symbolic system, of our interactions? And that allows us to look at the organizational aspects that are allowing us to be more, uh, have a concept of liberty. So I think there is an eighth deadly sin. And let me just talk real quickly. I'm a practicing Quaker. Um, they grew up in response to the ideas of science. And they were trying to create a science of belief systems. And the way they did that, it wasn't just that they have interminable conversations, which they do, but the methodology that they used was an information processing system of social systems. How do you structure the processing of knowing the context that you're trapped within? So, you know, the, the idea that you're praying through silence and waiting for, you know, somebody to speak to you, the revelation, it's a continuing revelation, just like science. But the, the process is, is to get all the ideas of individuals in a monthly meeting that then goes to a quarterly meeting that then goes to a yearly meeting. So there's a threshing session of the crazy ideas so Quakers used to be really large slave owners in America. They went through a process that said, wait, they may be humans. Uh, wait, we better educate them, et cetera. And then they became so like just close uh, to where I live was the Underground Railroad, you know, run by Quakers to be able to, because they decided through a processes that that system was oppressive not only to the slaves, but to themselves. So they were creating information processing. And what they did was how do they change uh, the system of Cromwell and, and the civil war that they grew up in? They gave feedback. They had systems, because about 500 Quakers went to prison because they wouldn't take off their hat or bow down to a person. So one of the ways that they did this was saying, we are trapped in our language. If I call you Mr., that's a shortened form of master. If I call you Ms., that is shortened form of mistress. And we know what mistresses <laughs> are good for, too. So I'm not going to participate in that. I'm going to call people V and thou. So they, they did a, 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 but what they did was created a feedback system. So 500 people were killed in prisons in uh, Quakers in, in England, about 500. But they did that by not tipping their hat, et cetera, because they wanted to change the system. They would not participate in the system because they understood by the silence and the ability. So let me just, if I could just share one screen. 
um, stages of conversation here. This comes out from a Dutch group. Here is conversation, deliberation, lack of understanding, agreement. How do we get there? There are really two forms. You can be a really good Jesuit priest and get the advocacy, the argument, et cetera, the dialectic, the lawyers in Congress, they go that pathway to the right. To the other side, you have to literally deal a suspension. How do I step back? And that's what I like about uh, Jason's uh, confidence. You literally have to go into ambiguity. You have to embrace juggling or you know, the idea that intelligence is juggling two or more contradictory ideas simultaneously in your mind. Then you look at dialogue, looking at others' assumptions, revealing feelings, building common ground, and the metalogue, which is what's the thinking of a, as a group building on shared assumptions now that you took it apart, the assumptions, and tried to extract yourself from the uh, strange attractors of how you see in the world, in the perceptual. So that's just a quick overview of, uh, you know, sort of cybernetic thinking. Here is another thing that you have conversations for relationship to start with, a conversation for learning, a conversation for possibilities, and then the one for action. And that, that, is, that just is just using um, a, an approach that may summarize some of the things that we've heard today. So thanks. So this so, also apply for, if you, if you go into a bar, that you start uh, drinking for the relationship and, uh, and uh, ended up finally with a, a bar fight <laughs> as, as an exit. <laughs> Jason. Hey, yes, I, I'd like to just make a few, few uh, farewell thoughts, as it were, because we're coming to the end of the session. First, uh, first, I want to make a general comment that, um, uh, in terms of the listening and the understanding that uh, that Ranoff was advocating, or many other people are advocating, certainly in the way we're working now in the region, it's very, very difficult to have a a, a real a conversation which we do come to understand each other, we would need much more time to unpack each other's thinkings, even with just the limitation of the seven slides. For example, today, I, I, uh, Lowell raised a question, some comment about past, which I didn't quite understand. Um, Jamie answered it, which I didn't quite understand, but but I, I didn't pick up on that because it would be too, too particular a side conversation to the main theme. So just aware that we need to be patient with other and over a period of time, get to know each other in more detail if we were to proceed. And I'm not, I don't see that we have any greater purpose other than to learn together about whatever it is we're interested in, how the world works. But the other final thoughts were what, what with respect to what Lowell was saying, I mean, Lowell has got some very, very interesting thoughts to share and they overlap so much with what um, I understand from, from, from conversation theory and some generally. One thing, comment I wanted to make was, you may or may not be aware that um, of the anecdote by Gregory Bateson, uh, when he was working in Hawaii, studying um, dolphins and so on, communication amongst dolphins. Uh, he, he got to know a, a, a local community. And uh, in that community, a 14 year old boy was guilty of some kind of delinquency. So the family came together to discuss what to do with that problem child. Now it took them six months and it turned out the family was over 300 persons in size. But when they finally met, they had a meeting of the whole group and they came to some, you know, some, some solutions. But they'd spent the six months amongst them all debating and discussion. So when they did finally come together, it was easy for them to come to some consensus because it essentially had already been agreed. But it's, it's, it was their culture that had this form of communication and so on, and it's very stable. And I'll just leave, I'll just ask Lowell, since he, he is a practicing Quaker, I made the comment earlier that I read, I read that the, 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 the Quaker groups frequently schism. This has been true of many so, uh, okay. know, groups. Is that the case, Lowell? Are you aware of these schisms in your history? 
of your of the group that you uh, first uh, Quakerism <clears throat> is a came about at the end of the Protestant Revolution, which was you have the Catholic centralization, decentralization, giving people reading uh, Protestant, getting the Bible, you know, taking away the middleman. Quakers are really radical. You don't have a priest, you don't have a father, you know, you have someone taking care of the graveyard, you know, but it, it is a group uh, interaction. So they're trying to throw away all the intermediaries that are power constrainers, you know, that, that you know, in a government, when you have someone between you and your decision, whether you build your house, you pay them off or, you know, in corrupt systems. So cutting out the middleman was, was really important. They're, they're all, uh, there's only basically two basic uh, schisms in, in Quakerism in the 1800s. One was the uh, monotheistic religion idea of the word and Jesus and using the word Jesus. And the other one was getting beyond the word into the system. And that, that was the epistemological. So whether you use the word Jesus or whether you just use talked about the system, that was the schism. But that was, you know, I mean, what was important about Quakerism is the way they informed the American Revolution. They started their holy experiment in, in the seven, or late 1600s, 1701, is when they created the Charter of Privileges about freedom of consciousness, trial by jury, all these things that became our uh, Bill of Rights. And so 50 years after that, that idea, they created what we now call the Liberty Bell, with a passage from Leviticus, which is 50 years after your freedom, celebrate li uh, your, your liberty. Then of course, American Revolution took those ideas of Bill of Rights and took over the, the, the uh, bell, which is great because that was part of the experiment. But it was how do you get to the larger context that you're living in and allow it to change? So it's a social change issue and it's epistemologically based. Not value based, not value based. What, what I found, what I found really interesting was how they made decisions, and Noel's really well described how their their structure works up through the chain. What what was fascinating was going to one of their uh, meetings. Um, they're not allowed to, to go in there with preset ideas. You can't take an agenda into the meeting. Is that is that right, Lil? So so that means you've already and you have that. to free yourself from the monkeys in your brain, which is yeah. God damn, I have to get the card oil changed. I have to do this. Yeah. Getting to and that then, point where you're able to be open and look at the cracks in your world. Because yeah. in the cracks in the world let the light in. <laughs> and and then the really interesting thing is there um, so I went to decision about whether they were deciding about whether homosexuality was all right or not. And I asked one of them, how did you come to this decision? He said, I don't know, but we, we seem to manage it. And the, the key thing there was they didn't vote. Um, the, the leader of the group, who's called the servant, I just thought that was brilliant. You know, he's put in his place. He's not, he's not a high and mighty. He's the servant to the group. He, he, so they take ego out the conversation. And then he has to decide what the spirit of the meeting was. So, and, and that I spent a lot of time looking at voting systems and how poor they are at making decisions. And this was a, a really um, interesting way of how you get a social decision out of a complex conversation. And, and what's interesting there is the issue of discernment. What's, what, it's an industrial strength process of Quakers. And if you're dealing with, you know, do we keep the piano in the meeting house or not, that'll never work. You know, whether you're dealing with whether I keep slaves or not, that sort of technique that looks at the larger meta system you're embedded in <clears throat> is powerful. Otherwise, and, and Quakerism is dying, so don't think it's any salvation, but they have some good, good epistemological systems thinking. Because what they did was grow up at the same time uh, when it was natural science and natural philosophy and natural philosophy dealt with the whole. Our, so sciences, so, now, yeah. our sciences now don't deal with that. So the Quakerism was trying, how do I retain the whole? Because if I just change a part, I'm gonna destroy the whole system potentially. What are the lethal variables, you know? <laughs> no, no. Oil, would, you, would you give us 
a thorough comprehensive introduction of Krieger's dyna group dynamics. Or maybe, maybe we can do a, a collection of different group dynamics. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that would be great. You know, it, it's just a methodology. It's just a methodology, like science is a methodology. I'm not selling religion here, folks. No, no, Lowell, <laughs> Lowell, Low, Low, thank you very yes. much. While you were speaking, I was multitasking. I was very rude to do, but I was trying to listen. I just had a quick look on Wikipedia. It says here, as of 2017, there were 377,557 adult qu Quakers, 49% of them being in Africa. So it's far from dying out, as, as according to its article, anyway. There's, there another, there's yeah. another interesting thing that they do, which is one of the things I found, the only social group that did it, and that was anticipation, uh, looking ahead as a social group. So they played a game called, they had a whole lot of different games they played. One of them was called Boundaries. So um, what they did was have a card, and they would take the card out, and they'd say, what would we do if the um, treasurer runs off with all the money, what would be the Quaker way of behaving for this? Um, and they would talk this through, that simulate this circumstance through. Now, I found no other social group that actually looked ahead. And um, uh, uh, I forget the name of um, uh, the, the uh, Harvard uh, psychologist, social psychologist, who Dan Gilbert. He, he did a lot of studies into why human groups don't look ahead very much because he asked a lot of people, what are you going to be doing in five years? Um, and what were you doing five years ago? And, it's, and, and the simple solution he came up with was one of the problems with social groups is our memory is better than our imagination and that we don't look ahead. Um, you've only got to look at COVID to see that we don't look ahead. Um, and, and the Quakers do. They, they go through what this would mean. And then as Lowell says, they take that up through their system and change uh, the process so they could deal with it before it happens. So, one, uh, of the one of the very... examples would be, uh, it's called the goldfish bowl. And this is particularly good with between generations of the younger people and older people. So you'll get the younger people in the cen center talking among themselves and everyone else being an observer saying nothing just observing. And then you switch roles and put the older people in the center and the younger people outside. And then you say, what did you hear? What did you see? And you start looking at worldview clashes, you know, the clash of, of beliefs and ideas. And then you're able to sort things out. You're able to get a threshing session, which is another technique, to be able to come down to what are we really talking about here? Or is it just your damn ego? <laughs> Well, uh, fishbowl has, has been included in the change handbook. Uh, if you could dig it out, uh, Jamie, you want to say something? I I wanted to just comment. Uh, I, I found it interesting that Lowell said the worldviews clash, like clashing is violent confrontation. I looked it up in the mm -hmm. dictionary, but there's actually another word, and that is called gestalt shifting. And um, so that you you just kind of, there is no clashing going on, but you kind of learn to shift the style. And now here, this may be controversial, uh, but this, the younger you are, the less experience a person has with the style shifting and the older one is, the more one has an experience. And so, so what is really then happening here is that the, the elders are reminding each other of the importance of, of, of saying in a gestalt, but then they're also inviting the younger people to join the process and experience it for themselves via uh, trial and error. And uh, I, I don't know whether Lowell was trying to say that, but, but that is the thing that I'm uh, interested in and that I'm working yes. on doing research on. Yeah. But, but you, you don't forget the Gustav shifting had a prerequisite. That is, people involved are all willing to be flexible, which is, uh, which, which is so you flex or so you can. No, may, may, may I respond uh, that this is not entirely true because the Gustav shifting starts with the baby, the baby that comes immediately out of the womb and, and has. 
And now I know these are all hypotheses because we cannot have a, an argument with the baby because the baby doesn't even talk language. Uh, but, but there are models being developed of a baby that learns to gestalt shift and that some babies are, uh, are blocked in some way and, and other babies do it more easily. And then the other argument is that the babies are much more resilient. Uh, so even if they're beating up, uh, even if they're in a hostile environment, they're still able to uh, figure out a, a way to survive and, 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 and feel good about themselves. But the ultimate uh, point of the message is that as they mature and learn to make more distinctions and add more categories, they, they must shift the stalls because otherwise they stay forever a little baby of six months old. Yeah, baby, if you put your nice baby into a cultural environment that uh, hate education dominate, then what you will get uh, out of that is conflict instead of flexibility because of think uh, shifting. Uh, Stuart, are you there? Stuart? I'm here. Okay. <laughs> I have a suggestion. Uh, Lowell uh, mentioned the uh, uh, Quakers and uh, he's willing to introduce us Quakers methodology and Jonathan is an expert on group process. He, he, he is willing to introduce us another group process. Uh, would you like to talk about the ICA group processes? I mean, not now, not today, but uh, we can schedule a session focused on group processes. Yeah, okay, in the future. <laughs> oh, in the future. Well, maybe the last week, the, the last Wednesday of March should be okay. Last Wednesday of March? Okay. It will be, uh, it will be 31st. Okay. You okay. So Jonathan, you okay. What am I doing? Group processes. Uh, uh, introducing a comprehensive a group process that you use, you're familiar okay. with. And, the, and, and, the group, uh, group processes generally of how groups work or how you make change to group, how you change a group? The one, the method that you use, because previously we, we heard, uh, we heard, uh, um, mm, the block of uh, um, the image is blocked. Okay, we heard Richard talking about uh, uh, anagrams. And uh, so, so uh, Stuart will do the ICA method, Jonathan will do your method, and the law will, will do the, uh, the quicker method. I, th I think the focus needs to be on how do you change the system, which of course you have to understand the system, but you have to look at the change delta. I think that would be the focus. Yeah, yeah like and the, the exactly steps. How do they, their protocols and their sequence of events, or if they have an endless conversation, how do they make decisions? Things like that. Okay. Agreed. Good. Cool. Who else are not spoken to? Larry, Lucio. <laughs> His comment on the uh, moral hierarchy of conversations for uh, one that seems to be missing is conversation for conversation. This valuing conversation by itself, sure, it can be used to resolve conflict, it can be used to generate new ideas, it can be used for decision making, but it has value in and of itself. Uh, and I think that sometimes gets lost. And I, one distinction I'd like to make. Uh, maybe this group can talk about it uh, uh, in future meetings, is between conversation and communication. Conversation is not about communication. When a conversation becomes communicative, it's over. Conversation is in the domain of dynamics. Communication is in the domain of relations. 
Jerry's original question about information theory that applies to communication. In conversation, information is continually being generated, new information, new variety. It's a converse of control. Uh, and uh, uh, it just goes back to the original uh, Shannon Weaver definition or description of, of communication. Uh, if we want to change that now and talk about it in a much more broad sense, I think we need to be a little more clear about exactly what we're talking about it and how it's different from conversation. Beautiful. No more questions. Time is up. <laughs> Can I make one comment? Uh, of Jason? course. <laughs> okay. Uh, first, I, I would uh, say that uh, uh, this has been a wonderful conversation today. And uh, I, I think I would like to uh, recognize that you as uh, just are being a superb servant in the Quaker sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I think your work here is uh, paying good dividends to the group. And uh, in that context, I would say that uh, I ran a, a small group in Washington, as you know, for about 30 years where we were able to continue a conversation for uh, roughly three decades because we had a, people, a group of people who wanted to learn, who wanted to learn from each other and who were at least civil enough to participate in such conversations. And so uh, I, I encourage you, keep up the good work. Thank you, of course. And uh, Klaus, you, your slide is here, so, so let's, uh, okay, this is being recorded. So at least you can talk the slide next time. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.